Good evening. I'm going to call to order the May 7th meeting of the Town of Los Gatos Joint Town Council and Parking Authority. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you and good evening. Council Member Stephen Leonardis. Here. Council Member Diane McNutt. Here. Council Member Joe Prasinski. Here. Vice Mayor Barbara Spector. Here. Mayor Steve Rice. Here. Continuing our tradition of having a youth leader lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight, uh, or for the year, but tonight we have with us Sam Ross, a fourth grader at Van Meter Elementary School. He's on the student council for the second time. His favorite subject is science. He was student of the year in Taekwondo. He plays the piano and participates in theater, plays tennis, participated in Earth Day projects, cleaning up the Guadalupe Parkway and River area with friends. Did you really clean it up or did you just play in the water and all that stuff with your friends? Okay. Uh, and he just went to Washington, D.C., where Sam and his brother were on stage with Cheap Trick as they performed in front of the Washington Monument for Earth Day on April 22nd. Very cool. And two years ago, is this just luck? Two years ago, they were on the same stage when Sting and John Legend performed on Earth Day. Sam, why don't you come on up here? Uh, let's give him a round of applause, and he'll lead us in the pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One more hand for Sam. And one more time, let's give him a round of applause. We have a couple of commendations tonight, which I'm happy to uh, do at this time. And first, I'm going to ask if uh, the representative from Andale is here. Would you come on up? Ignacio Flores, thank you. We missed you last month, but we weren't going to let you get away. All right? I'm going to let you hold this, and I'm going to read it. Actually, I'll do it this way. So those of you that paid attention last month, all of you, I know, we did uh, keep uh, Los Gatos beautiful month, and Ignacio couldn't make the last meeting, so, but I wanted everybody to hear what Andale does. And here's uh, the, the proclamation the recommendation that was signed by the town council. Whereas each April the town celebrates Keep Los Gatos Beautiful Month with a series of events sponsored by the town and local service organizations, the events focus on protecting, restoring, and preserving the local environment and celebrating individual businesses that exemplify these efforts. And whereas the town identified downtown business and property owners that embody the spirit of Keep Los Gatos Beautiful Month because of their efforts to maintain their storefronts and properties beyond their front door throughout the entire year. And whereas Andale Mexican Restaurant opened its first two Silicon Valley restaurants in downtown Los Gatos in 1988 and contributes to the character and aesthetic quality of the downtown beyond expectations. And whereas Andale Mexican Restaurant's staff sweeps picks up trash and wipes down windows and trash receptacle beginning from Andale's front door to the curb, including the pedestrian areas in front of adjacent storefronts. In addition, Andale is a Santa Clara County green certified business, business further exemplifying their commitment to keep Los Gatos beautiful. 
Now, therefore, the Town Council of the Town of Los Gatos does hereby commend and congratulate Andale Mexican restaurants for their efforts to maintain and beautify the downtown community over the past 24 years in the spirit of Keep Los Gatos Beautiful Month. Ignacio, thank you and congratulations. First of all, I would like to apologize for not showing up last time. I completely forgot. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the youngest guy that used to be around the town. I got too many restaurants going on. Uh, we had airports like Oakland, San Francisco, and believe me, we started with a little restaurant right next to Carrie Nations. So I, want to I would like to thank the, the town and the town council for this recognition. And muchas gracias a todos. All right, now I have, hope I can get this name right. It's Catherine Politopoulos. Did I say it right? Beautiful, thank you. I had to practice that, come on up here. We have a commendation for you, Catherine. I'll let you hold this and I'm gonna read it. Whereas Catherine Politopoulos has generously devoted 18 years of service to the arts in Los Gatos, beginning as a board member for the Museums of Los Gatos and then serving as curator for at least six fine art exhibits annually since 1995, and whereas Catherine has grown the caliber of the art museum's shows to more complex and varied content, including often including site-specific or interactive elements which challenged viewers, and whereas some of these creative exhibits included the largest retrospective of the art career of Jules Halfant, highlighting work at the Art Museum with a concurrent show of his printmaking pieces at the Jewish Community Center, the Green Show, which included the first fully sustainable green landscaping project in downtown Los Gatos, the Painterly Painting Group show with 13 contemporary artists, including Nathan Oliveira, which resulted in, the f in a first-time listing of the Museums of Los Gatos in a national arts magazine. The exhibit of two local high school art classes, resulting in the installation of the collaborative first prize sculpture on the terrace at the Art Museum. The seduction of Duchamp, which in addition to being the first first purchased show was a provocative exhibit on Dadism and surrealism attracting accomplished artists to Los Gatos. Claudia Borgna's, Borgna's uh, site-specific recyclable bag sculptures, which introduced an international artist to the community as well as cemented a working relationship with Montalvo Arts Center and its residen residency program. Now, therefore, the Town Council of the Town of Los Gatos does hereby render with special appreciation a commendation to Catherine Politopoulos for her dedication and contribution to the arts in Los Gatos. Catherine, congratulations. I'm going to have John speak for me. John? Just, I, just speak for me. Speak for the museum. It's, um, well, thank you. This is a little bit of a surprise, but Catherine was really the center of this museum for many, many, many years. And it's, it's a sad thing that we've now actually created her as the curator emeritus, but she's still with us, and she's still keeping an eye on us and keeping us honest. So congratulations, Catherine. <laughs> Wonderful job. Next will be the closed session report. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. The council met in closed session this evening as described on the agenda, duly noticed and posted. They took no action and there's nothing to report out this evening. You could have given me 10 more seconds. Thank you, Madam Attorney. As a reminder for those of you this evening who wish to speak on any matter, either on the agenda or during verbal communications, in the back of the bench in front of you, or for those of you in the front row, in the back of the bench behind you, are speaker cards. And if you could fill one of those out and turn those in to the town clerk on my left, your right, we'll be able to call on you. And hopefully I can pronounce your name as well as I was able to pronounce Catherine's. Council and manager uh, reports. We're gonna start with Wildfire Awareness Week. Just purely coincidence that the temperature rose into the mid 90s today, at least according to my car. Uh, with fire season coming up, the governor and Cal Fire have designated May 6th through 12th as Wildfire Awareness Week for information on how to maintain a fire safe property and practice fire safety in our parks and wildland areas, please go to the websites listed on the slide. If you live in the Los Gatos hillsides, we encourage you to check these out and take appropriate steps to protect your home. And there's your slide. Any other council matters? Seeing none, manager matters. Mr. Mayor, members of the council and viewing audience, we have a few items uh, to report that are occurring before the next council meeting. This Wednesday, May 9th, is the deadline for student commissioner applications. So we're encouraging all uh, appropriate youth of Los Gatos to apply for the student commissioner uh, positions. On Friday, uh, May 11th, the Los Gatos Library Friends Friday Forum will be occurring here in the council chambers from seven to nine. And the guest speaker is local resident, Alice Parsons, speaking about style at any age. The following day, Saturday, May 12th, is our next prescription drug drop-off from nine to 12 at the Town Service Center on Miles Avenue, being hosted by our police department and CASA. Last is on Thursday, May 17th, the police department in cooperation with uh, domestic violence prevention associations throughout the county and Next Door Solutions are co-hosting at the United Methodist Church a teen, violence, a teen dating violence workshop prevention program from 5.30 to 8 p.m. And that concludes staff report. And I'd now like to introduce Jessica Von Bork, our, the town's economic vitality manager, who will present tonight's Did You Know? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Did you know that the town and the Chamber of Commerce will be co-sponsoring our fifth wine walk this spring in downtown Los Gatos? The event is designed to introduce attendees to over 30 of our local wineries and vineyards, stroll throughout downtown, sample wines, and shop at the local boutiques who will be hosting the wineries. Tickets are on sale now and they go quickly, so be sure to get one. They are $40 if you purchase them online before the event and $50 the day of the event. With the purchase of your ticket, you will get a crystal event glass. And uh, flip it over. if you need more information or you would like to purchase your tickets, which we hope you do, please contact the Chamber of Commerce at 354-9300 or you can reach them online at www.loscatoschamber.com. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we don't need it. Thank you, though. Next is the, uh, are the consent items, which are items 1 through 13 in our agenda packet. Do I have any council member that wishes to pull a consent item? I see none. Do any members of the public wish to pull a consent item? I see none. And Mr. Mayor, we do have two desk items we on did. items 1 and 11. That should be included in any motion. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I'll look for a motion on the consent calendar. Council Member Prasinski. Um, I move to approve the consent calendar, including the items uh, that indicate were indicated by the manager as desk items. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Council Member Leonardis. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
Motion carries unanimously. Next we come to verbal communications. This is a time for anybody who wishes to speak on an item that is not on tonight's agenda to do so. I do not have any cards for verbal communication, but if anybody would like to speak, they're welcome to do so and they can fill out a cards card afterwards. I don't see anybody rushing to the microphone. So we will go on to item number, I'll close verbal communications and go on to the public hearings. Agenda item 14, conditional use permit application U-11-016. Project location 640 Blossom Hill Road, property owner Blossom Hill Pavilion LP, applicant Harlan Faust, Chipotle Mexican Grill. And our staff report. Well, Jennifer's coming back. Will be given. <laughs> we do have a desk item for council as well regarding uh, item 14. Yes, we do. Is Jennifer Savage. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Tonight's item is located at 640 Blossom Hill Road. The applicant is proposing to operate a uh, high turnover sit-down restaurant with 40 seats. They would operate from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week. They would serve beer and margaritas. The Planning Commission reviewed the application on April 11th and recommended approval. They did recommend that the condition regarding alcoholic beverage service remove the item of wine, which has been done so, given that the applicant is not proposing to serve wine. In addition, they also discussed the community benefit offered by the applicant. The community benefit involves regrading a portion of the parking lot shown on the overhead. It would be the southern line of parking spaces located on the eastern half of that southern line. And what it would consist of is not changing the curb or the parking space lines, but rather changing the level of dirt so it would provide the opportunity for patrons of the shopping center to pull uh, fully into the parking spaces and hopefully alleviate some of the circulation concerns in that shopping center. The Planning Commission also discussed the uh, question of sign location and design. Signs are not part of the conditional use permit approval and are reviewed by staff under a separate permit application. The considerations that Planning Commission asked staff and the applicant um, to make in designing the sign will be made as we review the sign proposed by the applicant. This concludes staff presentation and staff is available for any questions. Okay, questions of staff. Vice Mayor Spector. Thank you. Um, in listening to the Planning Commission's uh, hearing, uh, I did note a concern about the signage. Uh, and so um, can you explain to me what you, where you anticipate the signage to be? And I'm, I'm looking at the, the intersection on Blossom Hill and the boulevard. Uh, and there was concern about the existing uh, Hollywood video uh, sign. Uh, so since it's not going back to the Planning Commission, apparently, uh, and so, and we're not weighing in on it, where is this signage, what's it gonna be? Uh, so, as you're probably well aware, there is a, a dome at the corner, which Hollywood Video had a very large sign on. Uh, the space that Chipotle is uh, proposing to operate from is only a portion of that space that Hollywood Video had. Where it's located, it has limited signage area that they could place a sign that would be visible from Los Gatos Boulevard, Blossom Hill, or both. So we do anticipate that they will need to use some of the dome area, uh, but we do anticipate being able to work with them so that the sign, if it needed on that dome area, is modest and um, aesthetically pleasing in design. Go ahead. Uh, given the materials we have, is there anything um, that I can look at on our attachments or anything here to get a better idea of this signage? Chipotle, ha Chipotle has a, a variety of signage uh, at their spaces around uh, the area. So staff anticipates being able to work with Chipotle to find a design that they've had either um, in their current rotation or in the past to 
to complement that area, the items that you have do have a small Chipotle symbol. It's circular in nature on the site plan and the floor plan. It's on the right hand side of those plans. It's not in color, um, so it doesn't give you a lot to work with, but it does show what some of their text may consist of. Thank you. Further questions? Okay, I'll open it up to the applicant first. Hello, my name is Stacy Croft. I represent Harlem Faust Architects. Um, everything that Jennifer stated is correct. Um, I do have a slight concern about one of the conditions of approval, which is um, condition number nine that states that deliveries can only take place um, from 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. Chipotle's operate, standard operating procedure is to take deliveries in the middle of the night, between midnight and 6 a.m. Um, this is not a, there's no residential area directly across the street in any direction, um, so we'd like to have you consider changing that or striking that, that resolution or that condition. Okay, anything else you'd like to? No, well, aside from that, everything sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, any questions for the applicant? Council Member Brzezinski. Uh, in terms of item nine, this raise, wasn't raised at the Planning Commission, correct? Um, my boss was at the Planning Commission, I, and so I'm not entirely sure the entire conversation, but he might not have been aware of it at the time. I did speak to him before I came in here, and th it is an issue. Okay, can I ask the staff okay. to respond to that? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, was this raised at the Planning Commission, the issue of the change of, of delivery hours? It was not. Okay, and then if I could ask, there actually is going to be residential on Blossom Hill immediately north, okay. um, beyond uh, the corner um, commercial. There will be um, a series of residential units that, uh, that move down Blossom Hill. Um, so it wouldn't exactly be without some kind of impact if this is if this is middle of the morning delivery. Uh, how significant is this to to your your organization to be able to, to deliver in the middle of the morning? At the moment, um, the hours of operation or the hours that are allowed for delivery are 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. and that is while the business is operating. So while they're creating food for and prep for all of the patrons, they would be having to take deliveries, which would be, it would be an operations issue, a dramatic operations issue. Um, I would anticipate uh, deliveries would come through the front door of the Chipotle, which means that the loading would be between the Chipotle or the entire Blossom Hill complex and the Audi dealership. So it would have some. Okay, but it would be on the interior side. Of the, um, like the parking when you, when you deliver, let's just say we approve a delivery in the early morning hours, mm -hmm. the delivery would take place within the parking lot, correct? Correct. So the residential on the north side of Blossom Hill would be buffered by the building at that point in time. Okay. Can I ask staff a question? If you wouldn't mind staying where you are. Um, there, are there are a couple of other food services in the, uh, in the center right now, Jamba Juice and uh, Starbucks. Where and when do they take delivery of their product? Unfortunately, I do not have that information. Okay. I could ask the manager if there's any, any uh, understanding. I assume that they do take delivery of product. Uh, I've never seen a, um, a truck in the parking lot in the middle of the day. So this may be a moot point if that's okay. standard in that particular site. Um, don't know where to go with this, but I, you know, I think it's something we need to investigate. Other questions of the applicant? Mr. Councilmember Leonardis. Just picking up on what Councilmember Pruszynski said about the deliveries, um, your operation hours are 11 to 10 p.m. What would be the earliest? I mean, could you do like a 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. delivery? Um, a 9 to 11 a.m. delivery, how, how would that work so it would be less, potentially less disruptive to residents? Right. Um, 
I'm the architect, so I don't know exactly what their operational procedures are. I just know they typically would have them, it's the delivery time between midnight and 6 a.m. Thank you. Okay, I see no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and I'm going to go back to council for questions of staff or discussion or a motion. And I'll ask a question of staff. Um, across the street, we have the um, grocery store as well, which I believe does get uh, deliveries at night. And that's actually backing up on residential. When I read this, my concern was having trucks trying to deliver in there between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. That's when that parking lot's already busy. So I'm, I'm curious, where did, the, where did this particular condition come from? On more recent restaurant applications, we've included this condition when they are near residential areas. Certainly for residential uses, they don't want to see early morning or late night deliveries. But given the particular uh, site and use, we could limit the delivery condition in a different manner so that perhaps the delivery was limited uh, to the parking lot location and the hours were expanded to be uh, more reasonable for the restaurant deliveries but less disturbing to the residential uses across the street. And we do have some proposed language if you'd like to hear that. I would love to hear your proposed language. Uh, delivery shall be limited from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and restricted to the parking lot, uh, the front door at the parking lot, and no trucks may idle uh, during those delivery hour times. Okay. Councilmember Brzezinski? You said um, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Okay, so any time during the day. Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I'm more concerned about um, the, um, the impacts on that particular very constrained parking lot and having trucks in the middle of that lot at any time there are customers present. That includes the hours for Starbucks. Um, so I, I'm wondering if staff could not take another look at this and, and make some accommodation with the applicant to, because I, I don't want to see trucks out on Blossom Hill. If, if that were the case and they were, they were parked out there trying to offload um, the, um, the curb to lane distances are not sufficient to allow parking out there. So it has to, it has to be in the lot, but it shouldn't be in, a, in the lot at a time when the lot's not currently used, which means before Starbucks gets rolling as far as I'm concerned. So I think we need to take another look at that language and see if we can't um, get another run at it from staff, if you wouldn't mind, and then, and then negotiate with the applicant regarding this. Other than that, I don't see any other issues of concern. Any other? Uh Councilmember Leonardis. I was thinking, you know, we have the Acura, Acura dealer out there, and I recall when they do their deliveries, they park right on Los Gatos Boulevard. And being that this is close to the corner of Los Gatos Boulevard and the parking lot there, they might be able to use a similar technique where they pull up on the street there in front of um, the former Hollywood video and um, move their product into the front door in the evening hours or whenever their delivery ends up being early morning. And I don't think it would be disruptive of any parking lot or the Blossom Hill Road, as Council Member Przinsky alluded to, which I think would be problematic. So that might be a possible solution. Council Member McNutt. Um, thank you, Mayor. So the question to staff is, how do we resolve this this evening? Because there's some information that needs to be sought um, so do we need to continue this until this gets worked out? So what my concerns are is what the other uh, businesses in that um, shopping center have currently in their CUPs. Um, generally what our practice is in uh, freestanding shopping centers as opposed to 
downtown um, and then how much it's going to be safe for delivery um, person weaving their way through cars if they're coming in off the street uh, and very much how much it's going to disrupt the whole traffic circulation parking safety for the customers of those other businesses because as has been noted early morning is when they're in there for st I mean that that shopping center has its own life cycle as it goes through the day um, and I can't really think of any time when a truck in there is not going to cause havoc so back to my original question so do we need to continue this until this gets worked out or can we uh, it just feels odd to be coming up with some language without this information right now uh, staff would like to propose language this evening uh, to to resolve this what might be a minor issue um, we can consider the fact that when these when the proposed hours are used it is mainly in the downtown businesses um, where there is a strong concern of residential uh, impacts given the subject property in the building staff does believe that it can be modified so that deliveries will occur in the parking lot uh, outside of the existing business hours uh, as you as council mentioned there are existing shopping centers on uh, two other corners where they do operate regularly with deliveries uh, without those limitations in their conditional use permits uh, so if if it's okay with the council staff would like to propose new language uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Spector. You were going to say something, but thank you. That's okay. I, as one council person, don't understand what language you're proposing. Um, you said outside of existing business hours, um, and you also made reference to the shopping center across the street, which has a whole different paradigm uh, when it comes to a crowded, uh, overcrowded uh, shopping uh, parking lot. So. If you could clarify for me. <clears throat> Staff would like to propose that deliveries shall occur outside existing business hours. Staff would incorporate the hours after uh, established after the, tonight's meeting based on the conditional use permits for the existing businesses in the shopping center. And staff would also like to propose that delivery trucks shall use the parking lot for deliveries, not the Blossom Hill Road or Los Gatos Boulevard. So to clarify, it's <coughs> for all the businesses in the center, not just for Chipotle. Correct. <clears throat> the other option before the council would be as the applicant requested to uh, authorize deliveries from 12 p.m. to 6 a.m., which is what the applicant first requested tonight. Councilmember Przinski. Um, I'll comment to that. I, I, I find that probably the most viable um, time frame. And the difference between Cornerstone I mean, the, the centers that are adjacent, is, they all have rear loading zones, zoning areas. And so the trucks pull up behind, they offload, they don't interfere with the parking lot. This is uh, this unique lot um, has built-in complications. So if we were to go with the recommended language as proposed by the applicant, and limit it to trucks in that lot, and they're going to load and unload. I, I really could not see the the use of the boulevard as as appropriate because there's a right turn out of there, and you have to merge into the southbound lanes if you're trying to to drive on the boulevard from Blossom Hill. So that would be a problem as far as I'm concerned. But use of the lot limit, limited to the lot and offloading within the hours. That I mean, obviously those businesses are not operating during those hours, I don't believe, at this point in time. The, what was it, mid, midnight, 12 to six, yeah. Um, I could live with that if that were the language. I think as far as tonight's proceedings, if that were told us and then when we saw the language when it came back for our next run at this, um, we could adjust at that point if necessary. But. I, I've, I find it something I'd like to move on tonight rather than to continue for 
revision of just that language. Any other comments? I will, I will say I do rem my recollection was that Hollywood Video was actually open until midnight when it was there. It's my recollection. Back in the days pre-Netflix <laughs> when you rented vi DVDs there. Um, Councilmember McNutt. Uh, I believe Starbucks is open until midnight. That Starbucks is. Surprisingly enough. How we let that happen, I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> so um, just for discussion purposes, would you read back what you would do with uh, condition number nine, and then I'll look to council for further discussion or a motion? Delivery shall occur between 12 p.m. and 6 a.m. Delivery trucks shall be limited to offloading within the parking lot, not on Los Gatos Boulevard or Blossom Hill Road. Okay, it'd be 12 a.m. and 6 a.m., right? 12 midnight to 6 a.m. Yeah. Okay. So I'll look to council for a motion. Council Member Leonardis. I move to approve, go with the Planning commi Commission's recommendation and approve the conditional use permit U-11-U16 and make the requirement required findings in attachment one inclusive of the recently uh, discussed delivery times of 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. and deliveries in the parking lot only, not on Blossom Hill Road and Los Gatos Boulevard. Second. It's a motion and a second, and just to the maker of the motion and the seconder, just to confirm that includes the correction with the desk item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, yes, includes the correction in the desk item as well. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to agenda item number 15. This is PPW job 12-01, the pageant grounds renovation project 411-825-2501 and Council, I'll remind you that you have a desk item for this as well. Start with the staff report, Director of Parks and Public Works, Todd Caperso. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'd like to take a few extra minutes just to set the context. Thank you for that lead-in, though. Um, this item was originally presented to council back on April 2nd for the approval of plans and specs, which the council did not approve. Council requested an additional analysis of some alternative designs, which we have prepared. Uh, since the preparation of the council report, which you all received in your packets, staff and the prep project architect have been working to prepare uh, some additional layouts. Um, Staff received these plans late last week and was was unable to include them in the council report. So they were all included. They were all sent to you and included as a desk item. These same layouts which you received will also be in the in the presentation that you see tonight. A little bit of background on the pageant grounds. Pageant ground dates back to the early 19th century, where it was used for plays. The upper level was was regularly used as a stage with the lower level also housing sets and sometimes being used for a stage as well. In more recent years with the development of the Civic Center going back to the 60s, it's become more of a passive use area. In conjunction with the library project, the phase one improvements of Paget Grounds were included with that library construction project and the purpose of that phase one improvements were mainly to relocate infrastructure and utilities and provide for full ADA access up to both the upper and lower levels. The hillside location creates for a, a 3D effect with landscaping with regard to the landscaping because of the changing elevation we have the opportunity not only to take advantage of, the, of existing trees and plantings that are at different elevations but also introduce um, an additional plant palette at various elevations as well. Um, and as mentioned previously, a, a design was brought forward on April 2nd, which was not approved by council at that time. As we take a step back and consider the various factors that can have an effect in determining the ultimate design, we would like to, uh, we would like to highlight these areas. Um, that the visibility of the, um, that the visibility of this site is increased with the construction of the new library. Um, 
There may be a need for both formal and informal programming, uh, e either library related or otherwise. ADA, as previously noted, has the, the pathways that were constructed with the library project are now fully ADA compliant, but those pathways have established certain elevations that uh, must now be uh, accommodated with, with the current project. These elevations do limit the amount of grading that can be done on the site, um, and so we have to recognize that as we entertain the, the various surface treatments. Con consideration of maintenance impacts. All new facilities, any new facility that we build will have a certain amount of maintenance, um, not just by the materials of construction, but by the type of programming uh, and utilization of the site. We want to be cognizant of that as well as we move forward. Uh, environmental sensitivity. This also includes issues such as water usage, potential uses of herbicides and other chemicals, as well as the impacts of non-point source runoff and, and drainage issues. And we would like to work with the existing topography. As mentioned before, this is a hillside setting. Um, it's a wonderful site. It's surrounded about 180 degrees worth by the hillside behind it, but the 180 degrees in front of it offers wonderful views to both the Civic Center and the library, as well as the, out front to the Civic Center lawn area. Some of the decision factors that staff would recommend receive additional consideration as well will be the overall appearance of the site. Kind of goes without saying that it needs to be a nice looking site and, and, and fit in well with its location. Consideration of special event uses. Should the site be a venue, and if so, for events of what sizes, what frequencies, and to what extent? Construction costs should also be recognized as well. We do recognize that there will be alternatives that, that you will see shortly that will come at different construction costs and have, as noted on the next bullet, that, that will have different maintenance impacts. The maintenance impacts would include not just the day-to-day -day maintenance of the site, but could also include some seasonal impacts as, as well as annuals and even those that need work on a less frequent basis. The water needs of any new development are always a consideration even for private development that we, that we review in town. And this also ties back to the maintenance impacts. Uh, also site drainage for both sheet potential for sheet drainage, as, uh, which would be the above ground drainage, as well as any underground systems that may be required. Again, this would vary with the different surface types that, that you'll see. Bless you. So I'd first like to go over what we'll call design alternative one, which is essentially what you saw at, at the um, April 2nd meeting that we had prepared plans and specs for. This is predominantly hardscape treatment in the upper area, approximately 2,500 square feet, although it does include about a dozen new trees and several hundred shrubs and ground cover plantings. It does include a raised stage with a trellis, which is fully ADA accessible, that would allow the, the site to host special events. Design alternative two is very similar to design alternative one, although the hardscape area has decreased by about 20%, taking it down to 2,000 square feet, and includes the introduction of a small turf area on what I call the west end of the site, which is actually the sunnier end of the site, uh, of about 1,000 square feet, although when you compare the two in the drawings, it looks, it, it looks bigger than half the size of the hardscape, so I think those are, those are rough numbers at this point. It does ret retain the stage and trellis, so it can also uh, host a, um, a certain amount of special events, although slightly smaller capacity. In both designs one and two, we would propose, usling, propose using stamped concrete as the surface treatment for the hardscape area. While no final recommendation on a color or a pattern have been made yet, we have included a few photos of local examples that we'd like to just show you very briefly. Uh, as you can see, the aesthetics and patterns on stamped concrete can vary, uh, as can the slope, although that second one is hard to view, and you can probably tell by looking that that slope is not exactly ADA compliant, so not an implementation that we would recommend, but, uh, but nevertheless, it is a nice treatment. Um, stamped concrete can also have a, a variety of finishes on them, which can vary from a, from a glossy look to something that is a little bit more muted, like the one on the left. Design alternatives three and four uh, we've included in one drawing because they are essentially the same layout with a different surface treatment. The, the, um, and, and that surface treatment is turf in the upper area. Although the, the, uh, although the layout shows the, the nearly the entire upper area in this turf material, staff does have concerns about going too far to kind of the east back part of the, 
site around here where we've got the, the redwood trees are here, so we'd want to make sure that we stay a certain distance away from those, from the drip lines and the root structure associated with those trees. Neither natural nor synthetic turf is conducive to hosting, a, to hosting special events, so the stage and trellis have both been removed from these layouts. Uh, for both of these alternatives, there is a, a higher amount of O&M required relative to alternatives one and two. With regard to the natural turf implementation, the O&M is mainly attributable to additional labor costs that would mainly be due to turf management, such as mowing, edging, and weeding, as well as the water usage requirements. For synthetic turf, it's a slightly different dynamic because the, it's a different type of maintenance that would be focused on cleanings that would typically be as a result of the tree material that falls onto the site, as well as the accumulation of dirt. Um, also unique to synthetic turf implementations are, are the drainage system, which require a slightly higher level of maintenance than other implementations. Not typically a large issue. Um, for example, we are going to have synthetic turf at the sports park, and we're not worried about the drainage systems there. But because of the hillside setting and the potential for the high amounts of runoff, we would be concerned about maintaining a drainage system at uh, high, high volume operating capacity at all times. We did a quick look at the circulation analysis, and I apologize that all three layouts are, are, are very small. Um, but, the, but, the, but the main objective of this slide is just to show you that for, for all, of the, all of the layouts that the circulation is adequate. You can see for alternative one, there's an ADA pathway that actually takes you up to the stage and trellis. Same thing for alternative two. You will note that for alternative three and four, we did show that the circulation stops at kind of the upper landing area. Uh, and opens into the turf area, whether it is uh, natural or, or synthetic, because there is, there is no destination necessarily in that upper level. If we were to create something up there, we would need to address ADA issues at that time. A quick look at the capacity for what, uh, what the layouts could hold for, for different types of events. We did not show any events in uh, alternatives th in three and four at this point, so I'll focus mainly on one and two. Uh, with the larger hardscape area, the chair seating could accommodate 196 chairs, and with the slightly, with the slightly decreased num uh, amount of hardscape up top, it would be 164. And same for the table seating. Uh, you see a commensurate change in the numbers. For, so table seating in, with the larger hardscape accommodates 128 capacity, and with the decreased amount of hardscape, 96. Now to take a look at the comparison of the designs in terms of cost, um, maintenance levels, and, and whether we believe that they can accommodate special events. Um, I will refer back to the current budgeted amount of 300000 With that amount of money that's been budgeted for this project, all four of the layouts appear to be affordable. Only alternative four, which is the natural turf option, may require additional funding since there would be little funding left to serve as a project contingency. That's, one that, that's an issue that we would have to address if we go in that direction. Uh, regarding the maintenance for the, for the pageant grounds, it would have to be absorbed into the current parks maintenance budget. That we would not seek additional maintenance resources at this time, but the Im impacts would likely be felt elsewhere in the park system. Um, and by that, I, would, uh, I mean a, a decreased level of maintenance that would not be felt at any one particular site, but it would kind of ripple throughout the, the, the park system. So staff is also looking at finding the right balance between the surface treatments and the utilization that will help ensure that we can appropriately maintain the site and, and meet council and resident expectations. So that's why we've tried to balance what the maintenance requirements would be about against whether we would recommend uh, that we host special events or not with that particular layout. Other things that we would like to have considered, um, again, um, would be the would be the development of a special event policy, not looking to craft a, any particular policy tonight, but hearing from council what the expectations regarding the use of the site would be helpful. Um, while we have not yet budgeted a pedestrian bridge connection between the Civic Center and the pageant grounds, this, this issue has been evaluated and discussed. So prior to pursuing this element any further, we believe that we should reevaluate the need for this against what the final design that, that we end up with after tonight is. Uh, and the same for regarding the trellis and, and the stage. 
needs to be consistent with the ultimate programming of the site and in our belief it needs to be consistent with the surfacing that accompanies that on the upper level. Depending upon the desired surface treatment, as I mentioned earlier, we may have to address additional ADA issues, um, particularly if we go with the turf treatment in the upper area and we create any type of destination amenities up there, we would need to address that as well. That was not addressed in the layouts that you've seen to this point. And future funding for this um, project may or may not be available. And the, the reason why I bring that forward, it mainly goes back to the pedestrian bridge. So we've got a phase two project, you know, even though we're discussing the details of that, it has some definition to it and we have a budget for it. We do not have a real project with, uh, with any budget behind it for a ped bridge. So. Uh, I wouldn't want to rely on the ped bridge to help support what type of layout that we propose at, the, at this point because that may be years um, in funding. We may have to seek grant or alternate funding for that. So I, I'm recommending that anything we pursue is consistent with um, any package that we propose would be quote unquote self-contained so it can manage itself and meet the expectations with the, ac with the access that we propose. In conclusion, back to the council report, um, staff is requesting that council review the design alternatives and if a recommendation is to be made, direct staff to begin the preparation of plans and specs. The timeline, uh, which, we have, which we did mention in the staff report, um, could be approached differently depending on, on where we end up tonight. Uh, there, are, there are some proposals in there that would take very little um, amending of the planned and spec work which has been done to date and there are a couple in there that might take a little bit more work and we would actually need to get back with the architect to dial in the dates a little more a little more definitively depending on on where we end up that concludes staff report and I'd be happy to take questions provide clarifications and and even scroll back through the okay, yeah, I'll, I'll open it up to council questions I'm gonna start actually would you go back two slides please the uh, al design alternative to approximate construction costs, our staff report says 260 and that says 250. I'm just curious which number is correct. I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for not catching this. So um, this information is our most current. So what, what I should have done is, is noted that it differed from the staff report. So anything that you have in the presentation uh, in this presentation tonight is actually more current and I would defer to this so I, I stand corrected on what we put in the staff report my apologies no apology that's just getting the clarification that's fine the second thing is uh, for council information and I'm going to start with I agree with whatever decision I'm gonna make tonight I'm gonna do independent of what I'm about to say because I, we don't know where it'll go but I want council to be aware that they're is a committee uh, that has been formed that is looking at the desire to put together some type of a veterans memorial in town comprised of service clubs and and other interested parties and they have met they've looked at the pageant grounds and they have expressed a pretty strong interest in uh, the possibility of funding a bridge from the plaza across to the park i'd say that only for information purposes it's at a very early stage they've had one meeting and have another meeting scheduled but i did want council to be aware of it since i'm aware of it since i was at the meeting so with that other questions of uh, staff council member Prasinski. um thank you mr mayor in uh, in the staff report uh, the um on page five um bullet six <clears throat> is where you conclude that um, if we eliminated the active siting would be that would be contained in designs one and two and went with designs three or four that we would eliminate the trellis which i understand um, but eliminate the pedestrian bridge as well um, as the mayor points out i mean there there we are actively participating in an attempt to to get a pedestrian bridge there as a veterans memorial why would the passive use necessarily exclude the, the pedestrian bridge since it would seem to me that that the pedestrian bridge itself is is not tied to either active or passive use of that park 
Thank you, Councilmember Przinski. Um, well, that's a, that's a great point. I think what we were looking at was what complements the site and what is consistent with the usage. Um, in other areas of town, we've got examples where where if we pursue things like a, like a pedestrian bridge, and the example I'll use at this point is is the sports park. Uh, the installation of a bridge there would save pedestrians and bicycles about five to ten minutes worth of travel time from having to go down to Lark Avenue crossover and, and, and come back. So I see that as being a very important element to the sports park at some point if we can get there because it adds a lot of value. In the case of the pageant grounds, uh, if we end up with a passive recreation a passive park with recreate pass a park with passive recreational use excuse me uh, where we don't expect to attract a large number of, of visitors it's not it doesn't provide a lot of value from an accessibility perspective so I that was my uh, re, that was my basis for making that statement in that you can walk from the deck at the Civic Center down around the the, the route that exists now in probably about 60 seconds so it's not highly valuable as an accessibility route it cannot be uh, um, ignored that if, the, if it provides other value as as a memorial or as a fundraising element um, I think that's valuable so I, I guess I should probably clarify that I'm not necessarily recommending against it but I don't think that it that it's it's nearly as valuable in a passive recreation setting as it would be in, in an event setting Councilmember McNutt. Um, thank you, Mayor. I, I have two or three questions, if I might. Uh, first of all, can you, because I'm not good at judging um, spaces, the um, plaza that's on top of us here, how, how does that size compare with what is proposed here if it's the full original design of concrete? In terms of the square footage of the deck here, I'm going to have to turn around and hope that that Mr. Bruce Smith knows that number off the top of his head. I can give you a, an approximation. Um, the, the deck here, they can probably hear me okay. It's for the television. My recollection is that this is a smaller area than the pageant grounds are. I think this is about this is about uh, about maybe 2,000 square feet on the level surface, not counting the stairways. Um, I don't know exactly what bearing that has on it, but that's, okay, that's, okay, that's, that's what I remember. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, you know this this whole. Um, subject has caused me to give more thought than I had previously as to what what do we want that park to be and is it to be a pretty view when you look outside the library window or if it's going to be do we expect people to um, take a book out of the library and go over there and sit there and read well do we have seating uh, I see how much the uh, plaza upstairs is not used uh, for any purpose other than heat radiation in the summer um, so it's it's been an interesting thought process as I've I've gone through this um, in option number three or four for that matter does the waterfall still stay as something that it can be usable it does um, it's not something that that could operate uh, on, a, on a regular, and by that I mean a daily basis. Um, it, it would take some work to, to make that a little more operational than it is. Um, and so our, our original thinking had been that, 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 that the operation of that would, would, would accompany any special event usage. So if it's going to be more of an informal, passive type uses, it would be harder to define when it should be on or off. Um, well, I, I meant for special events, if, if we're 
if it were lawn there, you could still trim the oh, waterfall on for special Most events. certainly, yes. Okay, so then, um, so there's no seating there in option one except for the benches around the rock garden. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, and um, so all the tables and chairs and stuff would have to be brought in. Is there anything other than uh, frequency of use that would uh, preclude tables and chairs being brought in on top of lawn? So for example, if the Friends of the Library wanted to have a, a tea, uh, an afternoon tea, and had tables and chairs brought over there for that on top of the lawn, would that work? It would work, but that's where we get, that's where we start to get concerned about what it would do to the turf. If it were something that were to happen once or twice a year, it's not likely to be a large impact. If once or twice a year, turned into once or twice a month, I think we would be get, begin to have concerns. Um, what, what, because what we don't want to end up with is the same sort of maintenance challenges that we currently have at the plaza, which I think we all know is, is love to death. Some people would say over-programmed, but what that does is it puts such a load on the turf, and you can't point to any one particular event that does that. It's, it's the it's the it's the cumulative effect of the events so at some point we are we are put in the into the position where we need to shut the facility down and do overseeding um, top dressing the challenge that I that I see with turf and and combining that with any sort of event setup is that we've got some sun shade issues up there. Um, I wouldn't want to say that the entire site is without sun, but but there's certainly areas of it with, without sun, um, and we will have drainage challenges. So we will not be able to achieve any sort of surface level draining with turf because we're probably only going to get about one to two percent, and we're really going to be relying on percolation to carry the water off and in, during high periods of rain one to two percent will certainly carry water off but after periods of rain after morning dew the that ground may stay wet for hours for the better part of the day and when you place any sort of amenity on it whether it be table chairs or people walking in certain types of shoes you're you you have an increased risk to tear the turf up and that's where we see that um, if, if events of that site type are held too frequently, um, we're going to be fighting a battle with maintaining the turf in, in a presentable condition. So if we went, and this is my last one, Mayor, but okay. so if we went in that direction, that would be part of the programming policy that would, that's, well, that's actually going to be the next step, no matter which option we go. Is that correct? That we need to come up with some programming policies for this space, no matter what the surface is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Vice Mayor Spector. Thank you. Um, uh, without uh, following on what the mayor said, which is without telegraphing where I'm going since I have no idea, um, the challenge was uh, balancing uh, amongst a hard surface, uh, grass, uh, artificial turf, uh, runoff, all of those issues mm -hmm. conflict. The uh, once when I was examining uh, something for my own personal use. Uh, I came across uh, ground cover, uh, a walkable carpet, uh, that the benefit of which was uh, well, it needed less uh, water. Uh, and so is there anything out there, you're the expert more, much more than me at my house, uh, anything out there besides uh, lawn, artificial turf, and hard concrete? Yes, there are. There's a there's a variety of hardscape treatments. Um, stamped concrete on on the, on the one extreme is is a pretty basic installation. It it's kind of a it's, it's a one piece monolithic pour, and you get what you get once it's in. On the other end of that spectrum would be any sort of vegetation solution. There are a variety of of things in the middle uh, that include things like turf block. There's walkable ground covers. Um, that can take certain amounts of foot traffic. For any of those things, they tend to be rather on the fragile side um, and can limit how you use the site. Uh, it really does come down to a balance of how do we want to use the site. So um, in short, I'm probably not aware of every alternative that's out there, but, but there are a variety of, of solutions. 
Um, I think if we were going to go hardscape, we tend to to um, we 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 tend to go toward anything with with a concrete base. Doesn't mean that it has to be stamped concrete, but it could be a flagstone treatment or something because we want to ensure that we get the ADA accessibility met. You probably get the ADA accessibility issue addressed with the with the synthetic turf as well. ADA accessibility becomes a bigger challenge with natural turf because if it if it muddies at any point um, or becomes gets standing water or or um, gets any sort of undulations, it becomes challenging. It's not to say that you don't meet the the letter of the law, but you at some points, depending on what your maintenance standards are, you probably don't always meet the spirit of the law. So that's what makes it a, that that's what makes it kind of a tougher call. Okay, I, oh, go ahead, Councilman Berlin Artis. Question for Mr. Caperzo. Um, have you talked to the water district about possible grant funding if it were decided by the council this evening that synthetic turf would be a good solution to this project about a grant? We have talked to the to the water district, but not about this project, unfortunately. Uh, the, the grant program that, uh, that I'm aware of with the Water District has to do with turf conversion, and we're actually working on a couple of sites um, that will actually be in, that, that you'll see in, in, in the proposed CIP um, that have been recommended by the Parks Commission for areas that we should consider changing turf out to um, other types of landscaping that would have lower water requirements. And the areas that we're looking at, um, at least one of them has been discussed at council before, is the area in front of the Hills, Hillbrook LLD. Uh, the second area is the triangle uh, that's, that's essentially a landscape median island at the intersection of Los Gatos Almaden Road and Los Gatos Boulevard. So I am aware that, that there are grants oppor grant opportunities to change landscaping out. Uh, I am not aware of a grant opportunity at this point um, for, for in installation of new material. And I'm gonna check over my shoulder to see if Christy wants to override me on that. I'm actually gonna confirm it. I just spoke with the Water District about new projects and they currently don't provide any funding for new construction. Okay, so I'm gonna, this is a public hearing and there are members of the public here. I'm not sure if they're here on this item because I don't have any cards. We do have a member of the public who wishes to speak to this. You can fill out the card afterwards. We're just thrilled that somebody wants to talk, uh, other than us. Since, since Ray Davis isn't with us anymore, I find the council meetings very boring, but, um, or lack of color anyway. Um, my name is Philip Knopf, uh, the East Island, Montesorino. Uh, in just listening, I have a question. Restroom facilities for this uh, park, have they been addressed or we use restrooms at the library or council here. I was just curious, you know, you're talking about public gatherings and use of it, and I was just curious, has a uh, uh, restroom facilities been addressed? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Look to uh, staff if they wish to respond to that. Well, I can't say that we have given that um, a lot of consideration because there are constraints with the site. Um, that, that would preclude the construction of any sort of, of structure up there that would that we could bring the necessary the necessary utilities to. Um, so what we have can have evaluated and considered in the event that we host special events would that they either be um, in conjunction with the library. So I, I know we've talked about library related events that that would have access to the library, which is not exactly right around the corner, but it's not that far of a walk, or any events that would be done during times that, that the library were closed or outside of, or not related to the library, we would have to make the, the, the restroom facilities here at the Civic Center available, which would require opening that outside lobby where you can hear the doors opening as I speak. So that would be about as good as, as, as we could get at this point. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and look to council for yet more discussion or a motion. Council Member Przinski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Can we go back to the slide that had the um, 
the table and chair configurations in the hardscape. What were those numbers again oh, that uh, sorry. you had for each? I had to write them down because I can't read the screen. I know, neither can I. Um, mm -hmm. Number one. So for the chair, let's go through the chairs first. Alternative one, which is the, which is the uh, set of plans and specs that you had seen previously, the capacity for chair seating under that layout was 196 chairs. And with alternative two, it was 164. And then moving forward to the table seating, the numbers for alternative one are 128, and for alternative two, 96. Okay. I think one of the things we're gonna to have to discuss is how we wanna use this site. Um, but if you're talking 196 in the, in the highest number um, with just chairs only, I would assume this is for a wedding. Or, you know, I don't know, maybe someone's going to get up there and give a speech. I don't know. But uh, the issue that's raised about facilities then might be uh, significant. I can't see 196 people somehow accessing this restroom or the restrooms in the, in the library. So we're talking about a, a use that really goes beyond, I think, what, uh, what we would expect in standard and daily occurrences. Um, then in terms of tables and chairs, so these would be special events, obviously. That, that is correct. Okay, and when these special events are not occurring, then what we have is, is in both one and two, um, what we have would be then um, a concrete stamped or decorative surface of some kind that would be open. Be open. Yes. So you wouldn't be basically going up to the park and sitting in the grass. You'd be sitting on the concrete if that's what you chose to do. So it seems to me that by going entirely into one and two, one more than two, what we're saying is that we're really limiting the, the upper area to events. It's not gonna be attractive to, for someone to, let's say we put the bridge in, to walk over the bridge and stand on the concrete. It's gonna to have to be dedicated to an event, which as far as I'm concerned, really does now limit how useful this, this particular property is because that's the only thing you're going to do. And that's one thing I'd, I'd like to point out. Um, I think we do have to talk about, about usage and what our intentions are. It seems that most of the, the alternate alternative one and two orientation is to special events. And I really don't recall or having had this discussion yet. That, you know, what, what do we see as our purpose for this particular site? Um, with alternatives three and four, it is a park and people go to park and, you know, throw a ball around for their on-leash dogs. And, um, <laughs> Uh, where is I going with this? Um, or sit on the grass or have a picnic or, or whatever. So the uses of, of a park with turf in some fashion um, are a little bit more extensive and, and probably would be used more frequently without some specific organize, organized f event. Um, that's why I think we, as a council, need to talk about what we see as purpose up here. Um, and I, I, would, I would assume tonight we're going to have that discussion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on, on Council Member Pruszynski's uh, question. The, from my perspective, the fact that putting turf, whether it's synthetic or natural, which I'll get to in a second, does not completely preclude us from having an occasional special event there, I think that's where I'm leaning because I don't, uh, and I'm open to other th thoughts, but I just, uh, I don't see as much value and I don't see as much call for a weekly or two or three times a month events there where I think the more value is going to be, uh, 
whoever it might have been you, Councilmember Brzezinski, said, taking a book from the library and going up and sitting there and, and having a place that's nice to do that. I understand completely the challenges of natural turf um, compared to synthetic, and I thought synthetic was an intriguing idea. However, um, there's still nothing quite like the feel of real grass. And uh, I know it's a maintenance concern, but that's what we're here to do, which is set priorities. And, and for me, after a lot of thought, I'm leaning towards what we're looking at there, uh, design alternative three and having, a, having it as natural turf. I know that presents challenges but I don't see Town Plaza for the fact that we have to close it twice a year to oversee it and everything else, that people go, oh, gee, I wish that was synthetic turf so we didn't have to close it or a lot lesser demand for it. I just think that that's going, what we're looking at there is going to get used a lot more than anything else we might do. And I'll tell you, this is a shift because I was originally comfortable with what came forward uh, originally, which was design alternative one. I thought it'd be nice to have a, the pageant grounds be a pageant grounds. But I'm, I've warmed to this idea. So, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, this turned out to be a, a, a lot bigger issue than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and I had issues. So that's, I had a lot of issues. And then more recently, I had thoughts. Uh, and the issues were that uh, if you just want me to talk from my heart, I want it to be lawn. Uh, and then you go, okay, well, if it's lawn, then you have watering issues. And water is one of the biggest environmental issues in the state of California. Uh, and then you have staff talking about uh, maintenance issues. And we have a LEED uh, certified library, and now we're going to put lawn with watering in it. So I was having uh, uh, challenges with that. Um, as much as I liked the lawn, I disliked the the hardscape, the the stamps, uh, cement, or whatever it was called. Uh, I gave thought to artificial turf. I thought, hmm, that that might be a, a, a possibility to have a compromise. Uh, with regard to what we're going to use it for, uh, as I pointed out, and as Mr. Brzezinski said, the first time that I heard that this was going to be an event venue was when it was before us uh, before. Um, and I don't, um, now I'm coming to the problems and now going to some of the conclusions I reached. Uh, for myself, uh, I don't see this as an event venue, not a place for uh, a, a wedding. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't be used but not for, what were you saying, 196 uh, people, chairs, or 128 when they have tables, not like that. So some of the thoughts I have come down to at this juncture, and I'm really anxious to hear what all the rest of you have to say, is I still like having the bridge. Uh, and so the bridge to me would be something that I would still like to have in the mix. Uh, I would like the... Um, the water fountain, I know we have issues there, but the waterfall, uh, the waterfall to still remain in play. Um, then we get to uh, seating areas and um, turf of some kind and cement. Uh, and as it gets to those, uh, I think that we could have uh, an interplay amongst them. I would get rid of the hard edges, the hard square edges. I would make it flow more one thing to the other. Uh, I would have turf, whether it would be as much as uh, alternative three, I'm not sure. Uh, you might be able to uh, put a little more hard surface in so you could have more uh, chairs and uh, Ms. McNutt's uh, library group could go sit out there and have a meeting. Uh, I think that there is a little more tweaking that can be done there. So bottom line is the bridge, the waterfall, uh, natural turf, uh, combined with uh, landscaping and some hardscape that has not hard edges and square edges, but flowing edges. Councilmember McNutt. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I also have um, kind of gone full circle on this, and um, even as late as this afternoon, my thinking keeps changing because staff did do a really good report, I think, in pointing out from a very 
practical uh, perspective the challenges of this site and of maintaining it and so on. And I live uh, not far from here and I have one of those challenging sites where I have little pieces of grass that I <laughs> keep trying to nurture under redwood trees that it doesn't want to grow there with the roots and lack of sun and so on. So I understand that. Um, but will I get rid of it? No, because those three or four little blades of grass please me every time that they happen to show up. I was thinking back to when we were working on the library um, uh, design and you know all those times in the subcommittee with everybody um, on the dais here, that when we, when we figured out that there was an opportunity uh, as part of the library to uncover the hidden jewel of pageant grounds. Um, I, as I said, I lived down the street for probably eight years before I even knew it was there. Uh, it was only because my daughter, you know, roaming around the neighborhood, uh, found it. Most people have never um, been there. They don't know that it exists, and so we had this opportunity to introduce the community. That's why we wanted to move the noisy um, uh, equipment there and open it up to introduce the community and allow them to enjoy it. So then the question is, well, how do they enjoy it? What's going to be the best way for them to enjoy it? I mean, certainly it, it also introduces them to historic um, and having the waterfall and maybe at some point putting in some kind of little interpretive um, panel or you know, something that talks about the history of the arts in Los Gatos would be a good thing. Um, the artificial turf does not work for me in terms of being an historic, lovely, um, reclusive type of, of area. Um, it was important in those discussions that we complete the Civic Center, and that's why the bridge is real important, because it does have an, oh, sorry, it does have a nice flow then, and we have no idea of how we're going to end up with reuse of the old library, but whatever is, is there, it helps to tie it all together and encourage people to, um, again, to take, take full advantage of our, of our Civic Center um, property. The thought, that's so why I was asking about, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of the right word. I won't use hate. Um, I'm not um, overly fond of our upstairs plaza because it is so underutilized. It is just a big, hard surface that nobody wants to go there and hang out. And I'm always trying to think about, how, you know, how can we soften it? How can we um, encourage people to go there? So having a, an area over at pageant that's even larger than upstairs and also concrete, unless we added uh, tables and benches and umbrellas there all the time, so that like in front of the library now, you feel encouraged to go there and hang out, I don't think it's going to be a draw to people. Um, I um, went beyond the barrier last week and was over there just kind of exploring. Um, I disrupted um, a deer. Um, who jumped out of the bushes, who was eating. I disrupted a young couple in love, uh, also in the bushes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, people find a, a way to use parks in, in a lot of different ways. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I just, I don't want to create what we have upstairs, an underutilized, hard, uninviting area over, over there. Um, so, um, I originally, like the mayor, was okay with this idea. I, I, I was intrigued with the idea of lawn. I went back to the, to the plaza, concrete patio, whatever you want to call it. And now I'm back over on, I really think we need to have it as green as possible to help, um, again, encourage people to come and also to, to soften the whole Civic Center. We have a lot of hard services here. And I think having some extra green back there, like we have the green out in front, is really the way to go. Councilmember Brzezinski. Thank you. Um, I think we're seeing direction of travel here. One of the comments I want to make is, is in relationship to how we can utilize hardscape to the same degree we have in Plaza Park. Because we found out that we had drainage issues and we had um, areas that were not growing and we enhanced some of the, um, of the hardscape and, and it was not hard edges. I mean, it was, it was meandering, it was uh, appropriate to, 
to give us a sense that we have some degree of, of hard ground, but not a platform. And when I look at that site and I, and I you know, look at the, the root system in the, in the redwoods on the east side of the park, impossible, because the roots are at surface. But if, if we went back to our designers and said, look, we want to maintain a park setting, but we also want to uh, creatively use hardscape to allow us to create some areas, perhaps even some seating areas, some areas where we can put some benches that are permanent benches so that people could go and sit and read a book um, or do whatever else they do up there. Um, and, um, and at the same time, maintain the, the primary focus as lawn look at what the maintenance requirements are, look at how we can appropriately use the, the, um, the turf as it exists, or as the surface exists, to create a more natural environment. And oddly enough, as we're talking about the underutilized or unused um, area of hardscape we have right above us, if we wanted to have a conference or someone making a presentation, we could set tables and chairs up there. We already have our hardscape available to us if we wanted to use it. Right now, it's not used, and as Councilwoman McNutt pointed out, it's a barren land. Why would we want to duplicate that on the other side? So um, and that would be my recommendation that um, that we go back and take another look, and use that judiciously, and not necessarily dedicate this park then to the um, the purposes that we were looking at. I mean, the, the thing that, that turned me really kind of to what was really the outcome were those numbers, chairs and tables. Those are large numbers. That's a large space. And, um, and it really dedicates that solely to those purposes. So um, I, my inclination, and I don't know if the mayor is interested, but uh, my inclination is to, to direct staff to go with, with it would be three with um, appropriate adjustments architecturally to allow us to use hardscape to eliminate the, the major problems that exist, but f emphasize the, the lawn area, and it would be natural, it would not be turf, um, artificial turf as far as I'm concerned. I think it has to be natural turf up there. You, you pointed out how much more difficult it would be actually in terms of your preparation of the ground to do artificial turf, so that would be my recommendation. And I'll second. Uh, and for me, it wasn't the 196 chairs. It was the 196 people trying to get to the bathroom <laughs> right over there. Never <laughs> even thought about that. OK, I think we have a Mr. Caperso. If I may, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what that might look like, just since I have you all here. <laughs> um, the site that Council Member Przinsky is talking about is what what I generally call the the west side of the park, and so that's where the redwood trees are. I'm sorry, east side. Yeah, I think the west side is where the turf might actually do well. So along the east side, what we would very likely want to introduce would be some combination of picnic tables and and benches up there. Um, the the use of the hardscape would have to be would have to be rather judicious. Um, and may be confined to ADA access um, because we would not want to introduce hardscape over the root structure of the redwood. So we'd look at some kind of a porous treatment like a decomposed granite, something that allows uh, appro appropriate root health of, of, of redwoods and the turf. I don't want to give you a proposed design, but that line might be something right around here what I'm doing. So this entire area over it would probably about two-thirds of that will, would remain. Does that sound like we're heading in the right direction? Um, yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate that. And I think what happened is once we move away from the centerpiece and the stage, and then having everything somehow a focus on that, it gives us more ability to actually address the issue of the trees, the, the over coverage, the root systems, and so forth. And if it were, therefore, the east, eastern portion that were dedicated to benches and tables and, and um, a, you know, a permanent seating area uh, under the trees, it sounds like it could be um, a real significant improvement to that site. And I'll, if I can, to 
Council Members Prasinski and Vice Mayor uh, Specter, what popped into my head when you were talking about that east side is not dissimilar from the east side of the high school lawn where they've got that grove with benches and trees and that type of thing. Is that what you had? Because that's what. That's perfect. Yes, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Council Member McNutt. Um, thank you. And since we're tweaking this, um, we might also want to look at that lower level, which is now the rock garden with the benches around there, because if we're trying to create more of a, a, green, a feeling of green and lushness um, and the, the retaining walls and the path already are a lot of concrete up there, that it might be best to look at some other options for there that would have more vegetation and less. Yeah, thank you. All right, do we uh, have any further designing from the dais or shall we uh, call it an evening? I guess we have a motion in a second, so we good? All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That being the last item I have on our agenda for this evening, we are adjourned. <laughs>